Thank you, Tamara. She messed me up. Coming up to the pulpit instead of playing at the piano. Uh, Annette, I was thinking, what is she doing? <laughs> it's been a different month all the way around uh, on that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, you can turn there if you would. That'll be our, our text uh, for uh, this morning. I ended last Sunday uh, night's message with a few questions. Uh, and one of those questions was, is your heart with the Lord or are you straying? Is your heart with the Lord or are you straying? And it's here that I want to focus our attention uh, in these weeks that we have been uh, apart from each other. Uh, it would be easy for us to drift uh, and, and it would be uh, very easy uh, for us to maybe not even realize that we are drifting, that we are moving uh, away. Uh, and what I want to do is bring to us a warning uh, that is given here in the book of Hebrews uh, that I believe is very important for us in the days that we are living in. Hebrews 2 and verse number 1. So God brings to us this passage of scripture that is here to exhort us, it is here to encourage us, as well as these Hebrew Christians that were being written to, to go on. Uh, they were to hear God's word, and it is here that we are encouraged to listen to God's word, to really hear God's word, so that we do not drift away. Now, the chapter here begins with the word, therefore, therefore, which sums up the whole preceding argument that Jesus Christ is better than the prophets and Jesus Christ is better than the angels. If you were to take the time to read uh, chapter one there. And so he tells us here in verse number one, hold on to what's been heard. Hold on. So we must not, as he says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Lest we should let them slip. The word means to flow on by. It means to carelessly pass, to drift on by. Um, I enjoy fishing. I grew up uh, uh, doing that and, and love the, the part of just being able to uh, drift along and catch where the pockets of fish might be. But sometimes if you aren't careful, you drift into danger. Uh, sometimes if you're out there, you may have things drift by that would cause some problems if you just weren't paying attention. Well, here he says, don't let these things slip. Don't let them go carelessly by. Don't just carelessly pass on without paying attention. And so what he reminds us of here is we are not to forget how superior Jesus Christ is. And as you get through that in chapter one, the superiority of Jesus Christ. He is not uh, just revealed to us as superior creator, but he's also revealed to us as the superior sustainer, as well as the superior savior and the superior intercessor. And so because of all that he is, because of all that he has done, he has every right to claim our absolute devotion as well as our absolute obedience. 
Therefore, because of all of this, we are to give the more earnest heed, so we don't let them slip. Oh, may I encourage you this morning, pay attention to the Word of God. Don't let God's Word pass you by. And then he comes to verse number 2, and he says, Remember the law. Remember the law. For if the Word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. So he brings us now back to the angels. And this is referring uh, to the time of the Mosaic Law. This is the time, apparently, where angels attended uh, when God was giving to Moses the law there on Mount Sinai. Galatians 3.19 opens up with the wonderful question. It says, wherefore then serveth the law? Brother Paul is bringing that question to, to believers, uh, to, to these uh, Jews that had been saved that were trying to bring the law and incorporating it into grace. And so they were trying to make law and grace uh, equal. They were trying to bring in those aspects of it. And Brother Paul has to bring them back to this question, wherefore then serveth the law? Why was the law brought into being? And I, and I began to think about this uh, this week and this morning as I was going over the message again. You know, when, when God created uh, uh, this earth and, and all that is there and then created Adam and Eve, he told them two things not to do. Don't eat of the tree of good and evil. Don't eat of the tree of life. Uh, everything else was okay. Everything else was for their benefit. Everything else they were to enjoy. And we move from that particular time to the time when, when God is giving the law to, to Moses uh, there on Mount Sinai. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what you need to tell the people. And we have all of the precepts and, and all of that brought to us throughout Exodus and Deuteronomy uh, and, and everything that needed to go through. So we go from don't eat to all of the laws that were laid out. This is what you need to do, don't need to do. And so Brother Paul comes back and says, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, Galatians 3.19 goes on. Because of transgressions, because of the sin of mankind, because of what had taken place from the time that Adam and Eve had disobeyed to having children, uh, to having to children, having children and so forth. And man choosing to do what they want to do and disregard God. It was because of transgressions. And it says till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And so here we have the writer of Hebrews bringing us back to this particular time. The law carried with it uh, not only precepts, not only principles, but it brought with it punishment. The word disobedience, there in verse number two, every transgression and disobedience means inattention. It means an unwillingness to hear. That's disobedience. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I don't want you to do. And because we don't want to pay attention, and all we have to do is go back into our childhood, or watch our children, or whether or not we even have to go as adults maybe to the other day, <laughs> and just say, you know what? I was unwilling to hear, therefore I am disobedient. Children of God who will not hear, who will not heed the word of God, are disobedient. Time and time again, the nation of Israel felt the weight of God's displeasure for their rebellion and for their sin. And if they did not escape the just punishment, if they did not escape the consequences of disobedience, which we cannot escape, that we'll see in just a moment, the consequences of it, whether or not those consequences came swiftly or whether or not they came slowly, 
then I promise you we won't. We will not escape the just punishment. And so he brings us to this point. And then in verses 3 and 4, he now begins to make it personal. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, many times... This particular passage is attributed to the lost. And as an application, we can say, well, this is directed to the sinner. For it is a terrible thing to miss the great salvation provided by Jesus Christ. And to remember the fact that Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to pay the debt for our sin. There to be, uh, to shed his blood, uh, to cover our sins so that we might be able to have forgiveness. He was then taken off of that cross and placed in that tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and, and then laid there, that body laid there for three days and for three nights and, and then he arose from the grave so that we could experience the love of God so that we could experience the promise of heaven as our home so we could escape the punishment of sin. And the punishment of hell. It's a great salvation. And realize that no one will escape the justice of God when he condemns them to hell because they had said no to Jesus Christ. And so it can be attributed to the lost. But this passage is speaking specifically to the saved. Notice if you would, it does not say how shall sinners escape if they reject. The pronoun, notice, how shall we escape? Notice the word neglect, which means to be careless, to make light of. And so if Israel had but the types and the shadows to illustrate for them salvation, and they were held accountable for being negligent, how can we hope to escape this great salvation that has been brought to us by Jesus Christ? John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The grace of God has always been the basis of salvation. The grace of God is the only way that anybody has ever been able to be saved, as well as ever will be able to be saved. It's God's grace that brings to us that great salvation. And it was spoken to us by the Lord. It was confirmed by those who heard. And it's something that must not be neglected. These individuals that have been saved these that have been justified, these that have been secured by God's grace are to be doing something with their salvation. And Brother Paul uh, had brought that to us uh, in regards to uh, the purpose of the law. The writer of Hebrews here brings us to the point of saying, listen, don't neglect this great salvation. Conversion is not the end of our salvation, it's the beginning. We are to go on. And as you heard with the puppet skit, we have a race to run. Each of us, as we trust Christ as our Savior, are to be going on in the race to, to, to reach others for the Lord Jesus Christ, to pass the baton on to them. God will not cease to deal with us until we are brought to maturity. And this is done as we grow. As 2 Peter 3.18 tells us, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both glory and honor uh, uh, forever and ever. Amen. That, that settles it. That's where God wants us. To be growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, God expects us to bring forth maximum fruit. 
And that's done by complete obedience to his will. It's brought about by a practical separation from this world. It's brought about by a full surrender of our whole being to him. And if we choose not to grow in grace, if we choose not to, to continue to yield to him in every way, then we are going to remain infants in the faith. We, we will continue to be defeated in our Christian life. We will continue to be fruitless. And God does not want us being fruitless in our life. How long have you been saved? Let me give you a moment to think. You can go back in your mind, try to figure it out. Okay? If you need to break out the calculator, break out the calculator. You know? But figure out how long have you been saved. All right? So once you have that down, all right, I've been saved five years, one year, one month. I've been saved 25, 30, 40 years, 50 years. Hey, I've been saved this long. How much progress have you made? It's a little tougher. Where are you at in your Christian life? Is your service to the Lord a joy or is it a challenge? Is your service to the Lord a joy? Or is it a challenge? Let's get down to the basics of today. Let's get down to some things that you may be going through, some things that we all have been experiencing over this past month, maybe even this past week, maybe even this morning. Let's get into the question of, do you bear the burdens of life without murmuring? That gets a little tougher, doesn't it? Well, I don't like what's going on. Well, how are you dealing with it? Well, I, I, I don't think this is the way it should be. Well, how are you dealing with it? All of us are going to live this life. All of us are going to go through the issues. All of us are going to experience things together. Some will be dealing with, with other issues, financial issues, during this time of, of being laid off or set aside, or, 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 or those dealing with health issues that we've been praying for on a constant basis, not just within our own church family, but around the country, some around the world. Some waiting for death to come. How are we going to bear the burdens of this life? Are we going to murmur about it? Are we going to complain about it? Are we going to get all upset about it? Or, or are we going to trust the Lord through it? And depend on him. If Jesus Christ were to call you home today, specifically, you're going to come home today. We got the memo. You checked your text message. God said, today's it. You're coming home. Would you be able to meet him with confidence? 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him. Make your home with the Lord. Get comfortable with him now. Abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Again, if the announcement was, if the announcement was made and Jesus Christ had the plane fly over, it would leave its mark. It'd be trailing the, uh, the, uh, the banner out there coming at three o'clock. What would we be doing? Would we be shouting out, wait, Lord, stop, not, not, not today. 
I, I still got something to do for you. I, I'm not ready, Lord. You're not going to be happy with me right now. See, are we going to approach him with confidence? Or say, not now, Lord. See, Jesus tells us he could come at any day. And we need to be ready at any day. Because we're not going to get a plane flying over coming at 3 o'clock. I'm not going to tell you, let's go sit up in the hill country and wait for Jesus to come because he's coming today. You know, We're not told the day or the hour. We just know he's coming. The message here in Hebrews 2 is that Jesus is authentic. God confirmed that the message was true. It was confirmed. All Old Testament teaching was revitalized by Jesus Christ. Remember, from, from, from the end of Malachi to the, uh, the beginning of, of the Gospels of the time that we have the message coming to Mary and to Elizabeth that John the Baptist was going to be born and then, and then the Savior was going to be born. And all of that taking place, there was 400 silent years. And Jesus Christ revitalized all of this. And a New Testament truth was revealed by him. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Jesus took the law of Moses and he lifted the commandments to new heights so that murder was now unmasked as hatred and adultery was unmasked as lust. He clothed the truth with flesh. He clothed the truth with blood. Living it out every moment of every day. God confirmed his message that it was true by the witnesses. I mean, the, the disciples were able to walk and talk with Jesus for three and a half years. They took in his words. They learned from his examples. They were given many infallible truths after his resurrection. Acts 1.3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They had those infallible proofs. Notice, if you would, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. 2 Peter 1 verse 16. The Bible says to us, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then look at First John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. God confirmed the message was true by himself. And God bore witness by signs and wonders and all kinds of miracles and gifts to convince the Jews, to convince the Gentiles, to confirm the message to us as a Christian today. These words are his words. They're words of life. 
Now, you may be this morning asking yourself the question, well, what can I do? If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've neglected God's great salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. What you must do is come by faith, believing what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, being buried and rising again. And you must believe that Jesus did that for you. That he paid the price for your sin. And you can call upon him. And you can be saved this morning. One of the things about our live streaming is the visual. Sometimes I'm able to see the conviction but God can see the conviction on your heart and your eyes today. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, may I encourage you. Receive the Lord. Don't put it off. And then let us know that you trusted Christ as your Savior. But as a child of God, what can I do? If I am not to neglect this so great salvation, if I am not to be careless... If I am not to make light of God's word, what am I to do? And if I've done these things, if I have been careless, if I have neglected, then come by faith and confess your sin. Seek the forgiveness of the Lord. If we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us. We can claim his promises that he's given to us in his word, we can yield our life and have him have full control. That's what he desires. Our eyes are to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're to be off of self. They are to be off of others. He does not want us to be drifting, just going along, not paying attention. He wants us to trust his word to live our lives for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this encouraging message that warns us about just drifting away, just going by carelessly. Lord, it's too easy, especially not being together not having the encouragement on a weekly basis to see each other, to hug each other, just to gain that physical encouragement. But, Lord, you've promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And I pray that we would live our lives for you. I pray that we would not just go on carelessly neglecting the word, but that we would take heed to it. I do pray if there is someone that's not saved, they've never by faith trusted you alone. They may be trusting their religion. They may be trying to add something to you, Jesus, as uh, those were trying to do through Galatians. But God, you paid the price. Uh, Jesus, you are the only way, the truth, and the life. There is nothing that can be set aside with you Nothing that can take precedence over you. You alone are the Savior. And Lord, you alone are the one that we are to look to and serve with all of our heart, our soul, our mind. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving to us these encouraging words for the warnings that we have before us. May we not be disobedient, but may we be obedient. I thank you for all that you do for us. Bless and have your way in each heart, in each life, in each home. God, that you would have the freedom to work and bring about decisions that you would want. I pray and ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.